Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Jamie, Lily, Ostara, Chloe, and Bella. As always, I want to remind you to stay safe, healthy, hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, and hit the notification bell. And today we're going to get into the final reading of Stephen King's Pet Cemetery, and let's get there. Okay, today we are going to start and finish up the last 14 pages of Stephen King's Pet Cemetery, and the next book will be The Odyssey by Homer, tra translated by Robert Fitzgerald, but let's get into the final part of Pet Cemetery. And we are on chapter 61. Lewis paused on the soft shoulder to let in a Renko truck loaded with chemical fertilizer blast by him, and then he crossed the street to Judd's house. Trailing his shadow to the west behind him, he held an open can of Halo cat food in one hand. Church saw him crossing and sat up his eyes watchful. Hi, Church, Lewis said, surveying the silent house. Want some grub? He put the can of cat food down in the trunk of the Chevette and watched as Church leapt lightly down from his roof and began to eat. Lewis put his hand in his jacket pocket. Church looked around at him, tensing as if reading his mind. Lewis smiled and stepped away from the car. Church began to eat again, and Lewis took a syringe from his pocket. He stripped the paper covering from, from it and filled it with 75 milligrams of morphine. He put the multi-dose vial back in his jacket and walked over to Church, who looked around again mistrustfully. Lewis smiled at the cat again and said, Go on, eat up, church. Hey ho, let's go, right? He stroked the cat. Felt its back ar its back arch, and when church went back to his meal again, Lewis seized it around its stinking guts and sunk the needle deep into its haunch. Church went electric in his grip, struggling against him, spitting and clawing, but Lewis held on and depressed the plunger all the way. Only then did it did he let go. The cat leapt off the chevet, hissing like a tea kettle. Yellow green eyes wild and baleful, the needle and syringe de dangled from its haunch as it leapt, then fell out and broke. Lewis was indifferent. He had more of everything. The cat started for, for the road, then turned back toward the house as if remembering something. It got halfway there and then began to weave drunkenly. It made the steps, leapt up to the first one, then fell off. It lay on the bare patch at the foot of the porch, steps on its side. Breathing weakly, Lewis glanced into the Chevette. If he had needed more confirmation than the stone that had replaced his heart, he had it. Rachel's purse on the seat, her scarf and a clutch of plane tickets spilling out of a Delta Airlines folder. When he turned around again to walk to the church, to the porch, Church's side had ceased its rapid, fluttering, fluttery movement. Church was dead again. Lewis stepped over and mounted the porch steps. Gage. It was cool in the front hall, cool and dark. The single words fell into the silence like a stone down a deep drilled well. Lewis threw another. Gage? Nothing. Even the tick of the clock in the pollard ceased. This morning there had been no one to wind it, but there were tracks on the floor. Lewis went into the living room. There was the smell of a cigarette, stale and long since burned out. He saw a judge's chair by the window. Which pushed askew as if he had gotten up suddenly. There was an ashtray on the windowsill, and in it a neat roll of cigarette ash. Judd sat here watching, watching for what? For me, of course, watching for me to come home. Only he missed me. Somehow he missed me. Lewis glanced at the four beer cans lined up in a neat row. Not enough to put him to sleep, but maybe he'd gotten up to the bathroom, however it had been. It was just a little bit too good to have been perfectly accidental, wasn't it? The muddy tracks approached the chair by the window. Mixed among the human tracks were a few faded ghostly cat prints, as if Church had walked in and out of the grave dirt left by Gage's small shirt shoes. Then the tracks made for the swinging door leading into the kitchen. Heart thudding, Lewis followed the tracks. He pushed the door open and saw Judd's splayed feet, his old green work pants, his checked flannel shirt. The old man was lying sprawled in a wide 
pool of drying blood. Lewis glanced at his hands to his face as if to blight his own vision. But there was no way to do that. He saw eyes, Judd's eyes, open, accusing him. Perhaps even accusing himself of setting this in motion. But did he? Lewis wondered. Did he really do that? Judd had been told by Stanny B. And Stanny B. had been told by his father. And Stanny B.'s father had been told by his father, the last traitor to the Indians, a Frenchman from the North Country in the days when Franklin Pierce had been a living president. Oh, Judd, I'm so sorry, he whispered. Judd's blank eyes stared at him. So sorry, Lewis repeated. His so feet seemed to have moved by themselves, and he was suddenly back to last Thanksgiving in his mind. Not to that night when he and Judd had taken the cat up to the pet cemetery and beyond, but to the turkey dinner Norman put on the table, all of them laughing and talking, the two men drinking beer, and Norma, the glass of white wine. When she had taken the white lawn tablecloth from the cloth from the lower table drawer as he was taking it now, but she had put it on the table and then anchored it with lovely pewter candlestick holders while he, Lewis watched it billow down over Judd's body like a collapsing parachute, mercifully covering that dead face. Almost immediately, tiny rose petals of deepest, darkest scarlet began to stain the white lawn. I'm sorry, said for a third time. So, so. Then something moved overhead. Something scraped and the word broke off between the lips. It had been soft, it had been stealthy, but it had been deliberate. Oh, yes, he was convinced of that. A sound he had been meant to hear. His hands wanted to tremble, but he would not allow them. He stepped over to the kitchen table with a checkered, checkered oil cloth covering and reached into his pocket. He moved three more Becton Dixon syringes, stripped them off their paper coverings, and laid them out in the Neat row, he removed three more multi-dose multi vials and filled each of the syringes with enough morphine to kill a horse, or hand ready the bowl, bowl, if it came to that. He put them in his pocket again. He left the kitchen, crossed the living room, and stood at the base of the stairs. Gage? From somewhere in the shadows above, there came a giggling, and cold and sunless laughter that made the skin on Lewis's brick, excuse me, back prickle. He started up. It was a long walk to the top of those stairs. He could well imagine a condemned man taking a walk almost as long and as harsh and as horribly short to the platform of a scaffold with his hands tied behind his back, knowing that he would piss when he could no longer whistle. He reached the top at last, one hand in his pocket, staring only at the wall. How long did he stand that way? He did not know. He could now feel his sanity beginning to give way. This was an actual sensation, a true thing. It was interesting. He imagined a tree overloaded with ice in a terrible storm would feel this way, if trees could feel anything. Shortly before toppling, it was interesting, and it was sort of amusing. Gage, want to go to Florida with me? That giggle again. Lewis turned and was greeted by the sight of his wife, to whom he had once carried a rose in his teeth, lying halfway down the hall, dead. Her legs were splayed out as... Judd's had been. Her back and head were cocked at an angle against the wall. She looked like a woman who had gone to sleep while reading in bed. He walked down toward her. Hello, darling, he thought. You came home. Blood had splashed the wallpaper in idiot shapes. She had been stabbed a dozen times. Two dozen, who knew? His scalpel had done this, this work. Suddenly he saw her, really saw her, and Lewis Creed began to scream. His screams echoed and racketed shrilly through this house where now only dead lived and walked, eyes bulging, face lived. Hair standing on end, he screamed. The sounds came from his swollen throat like the bells of hell. Terrible shrieks that signaled the end not of love but of sanity. And his mind and all the hideous images were suddenly unloosed at was suddenly unloosed at once. Victor Pascal dying on the infirmary carpet, church coming back with bits of green plastic in his whiskers, Gage's baseball cap lying in the road full of blood, but most of all that thing he had seen near Little God Swamp. The thing that had pushed the tree over, the thing with the yellow eyes, the Wend Wendigo, creature of the North Country. The dead thing whose touch awakens unspeakable unspe appetites. Rachel had not just been killed, something had been, something had been at her. Click. That click was in his head. It was the sound of some re relay f using and burning out forever. The sound of lightning stroking down in a direct hit, the sound of the door opening. He looked up numbly, the screams still shivering in his throat, and here was Gage at last. 
his mouth smeared with blood, his chin dripped, his lips pulled back in a hellish grin. In one hand, he held Lewis's scalpel. As he brought it down, Lewis pulled back with no real thought at all. The scalpel whisked past, wh wickered past his face and gauge overbalanced. He is as clumsy as church, Lewis thought. Lewis kicked his feet from under him. Gage fell awkwardly, and Lewis was on him before he could get up, he was straddling him, one knee pinning the hand which held the scalpel. No, the thing under him panted. Its face twisted and writhed. Its eyes were baleful and sectile in their stupid hate. No, no, no. Lewis clawed for one of the hypos, for one of the hypos, got it out. He would have to be quick. The thing under him was like a greased fish, and it would not let go of the scalpel, no matter how hard he bore down on its wrist. And his face seemed to ripple and change even as he looked at it. It was Judd's face. Dead and staring, it was the dented, ruined face of Victor Pascal. Eyes rolling mindlessly, it was mi mirror-like, Lewis's own. So dreadfully pale and lunatic. Then it changed again and became the dead, became the face of that, that creature in the woods, the low brow. The dead yellow eyes, the tongue long, long and pointed and bifurcated, bifurcated, grinning and hissing. No, 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 it bucked beneath him. The hypo flew out of Lewis's hand, he rolled a short way down the hall. He groped for another, brought it out and jammed it straight down to the smaller gauge's back. Screamed beneath him, body straining and sunfishing, nearly throwing him off. Grunting, Lewis got the third syringe and jammed this one home in Gage's arm, depressing the plunger all the way. He got off them and began to back slowly down the hallway. Gage got slowly to his feet and began to stagger toward him. Five steps and the scalpel fell from its hand. It struck the first blade first and st stuck itself in the wood, quivering. Ten steps and that strange yellow light in its eyes began to fade. A dozen and it fell to its knees. Now Gage looked up at him, and for a moment, Lewis saw his son, his real son, his face unhappy and filled with pain. Daddy, he cried, and fell forward on his face. Lewis stood there for a moment, then went to Gage, moving carefully, expecting some trick. But there was no trick, no sudden leap with clawed hands. He slid his fingers expertly down Gage's throat, found the pulse, and held it. He was then a doctor for a the last time in his life, monitoring the pulse, monitoring till there was nothing. Nothing inside, nothing outside. When it was gone at last, Lewis got up and sauntered down the hall to a far corner. He crouched there, pulled himself into a ball, cramming himself into the corner tighter and tighter. He found he could not make himself smaller if he put a thumb in his mouth, and so he did that. He, he, he could make himself smaller if he put a thumb in his mouth, and so he did that. He remained that way far better than two hours, and then, little by little, a dark and also plausible idea came to him. He pulled his thumb from his mouth. He made a little small pop. Lewis got himself. Hey, ho, let's go. Going in, in the room where Gage had hidden, he stripped the sheet from the bed and took it out into the hall. He wrapped his wife's body in it. Gently with love. He was humming but did not realize it. He found gasoline in Judd's garage, five gallons of it in a red can next to the lawn boy, more than enough. He began in the kitchen where Judd where Judd lay under the Thanksgiving tablecloth. He drenched that, then moved into the living room with the can still appended, spraying amber gas over the ring. The soap and the magazine rack, the chairs and that's <clears throat> so out into the downstairs hall and toward the back bedroom. The smell of gas was strong and rich. Judd's matches were by the chair where he had kept his fruitless watch on top of his cigarettes. Lewis took them. At the front door, he tossed a lighted match back over his shoulder and stepped out. The blast of the heat was immediate and savage, making the skin on his neck feel too small. He shut the neat door neatly and only stood on the porch for a moment, watching the orange flickers behind Noma's cushion. Then he crossed the porch, pausing for a moment, remembering the beers he and Judd had drunk here a million years ago, listening to the soft gathering roar of fire within the house. Then he stepped out. Send a chapter 61 on to 62. Steve Masterton came around a curb just be the curb just before Lewis's house and saw the smoke immediately. Not from Lewis's place, but from the house that belonged to the old duck the old duck across the street. He had come out this morning because he had been worried about Rachel. I mean, about Lewis, deeply worried. Charlton had told him about Rachel's call of the day before, and that had set him to wondering just where Lewis was, what he was up to. His worry was vague, but it itched at his mind. 
he wasn't going to feel right until he had gone out there and checked to see if things were okay, or as okay as they could be under the circumstances. The spring weather had emptied the infirmary like white magic, and surrender had told him to go ahead. He could handle whatever came up. So Steve had jumped into his Honda, which he had liberated from the garage only last weekend, and headed out for Ludlow. Maybe it pushed the cycle a little faster than was strictly necessary, but the worry was there. It gnawed, and with it came the absurd feeling that it was already too late. Stupid, of course, but in the pit of his stomach there was a feeling similar to the one he had had their last fall when the pa that Pascal thing cropped up. A feeling of miserable surprise and almost leaden disillusion. Uh, disillusion. He was by no means a religious man. In college, Steve had been a member of the Atheist Society for two semesters, dropped out only when his advisor had told him privately and very much off the record that it might hurt his chances to obtain a med school scholarship later on. But he supposed he felt, felt as much heir to whatever biological or biorhythmic conditions passed for premonitions as any other human being in the death of Pascal would seem to set a tone for the year which followed somehow. Not a good year by any means. To his surrender his relatives had been clapped in jail back home, some political thing. Surrender had told him that he believed one of them, an uncle he cared for very much, might well now be dead. Surrender had wept, and the tears from the usually benign Indian had frightened Steve, and Charlton's mother had had a radical mastectomy. The tough nurse was not very optimistic about her mother's chances for joining the five-year club. Steve himself had attended four funerals since the death of Victor Pascal, his wife's sister killed in a car crash, a cousin killed in a freak accident as a result of a barroom bet he had been electrocuted while proving he could shinny all the way to the top of a power pole, a grandparent, and of course Lewis's little boy. He liked Lewis enormously and he wanted to make sure Lewis was all right. Lewis had been through hell lately. When he saw the billows of smoke, his first thought was that this was something else to lay at the door of Victor Pascal, who seemed in his dying to have removed some sort of crash barrier between these ordinary people and an extraordinary run of bad luck. But that was stupid, and Lewis's house was the proof. It stood calm and white, a little piece of clean-limbed New England architecture in the mid-morning sun. People were running toward the old duck's house. And as Steve banked his bike across the road and pulled into Lewis's driveway, he saw a man dash up onto the old duck's porch. Stephen King's humor. Approach the front door and then retreat. <clears throat> it was well that he did. A moment later, the glass pane in the center of the door blew out and flames boiled through the opening. If the fool actually had gotten the door open, the blowout would have cooked him like a lobster. Steve dismounted and put the Honda in it on its kickstand. Lewis momentarily forgotten. He was drawn by all the mis... All the old mystery of fire, maybe half a dozen people had gathered, except for the would-be hero who lingered in the Crandall's lawn, on the Crandall's lawn. They kept a, dis a respectful distance. Now the windows between the porch and the house blew out. Glass danced in the air. The would-be hero ducked and ran for it. Flames ran up the inner wall of the porch like groping hands, blistering the white paint. As Steve watched, one of the rattan easy chairs smoldered and then exploded into flame. Over the crackling sounds, he heard the would-be hero cry out the shrill and absurd sort of optimism. Gonna lose her, gonna lose her. If Judd's there, he's a gone goose. He is. Told them about the creosote in that chimbley a hundred times. Steve opened his mouth to holler across and asked if the fire department had been called, but just then he heard the faint wail of sirens approaching, a lot of them. They had been called, but the would-be hero was right. The house was going. Flames probed through half a dozen broken windows now, and the front eve had grown in almost, in almost transparent membrane of fire over its bright green shingles. <laughs> a little bit there. He turned back, then remembering Lewis, but if Lewis were here, wouldn't be, he be with the others across the street? Steve caught something, then just barely caught it with the tail of his eye. Beyond the head of Lewis's hut-top driveway, there was a field that stretched up a long, gentle, rising hill. The Timothy grass although still green, had grown high already this May. But Steve could see a path almost as neatly mowed as a pudding green on a golf course. It wound and meandered its way up the slope of the field, rising to meet the woods that began thick and green. Just below the horizon, it was here, where the pale green of the Timothy grass met the thicker, denser green of the 
woods that Steve had seen in mo movement. A flash of bright white that seemed to be moving was gone almost as soon as his eye registered it, but it had seemed to him for that brief moment that he had seen a man carrying a white bundle. That was Lewis, his mind told him. Sudden irrational certainty. That was Lewis, and you better get to him quickly. Quick, because something damn bad has happened pretty quick. Something even more damn bad is going to happen if you don't stop him. He stood indecisively at the head of the driveway, shifting one foot for the other, his weight, his weight, excuse me, his weight jittery between the two of them. Steve, baby, you were scared shitless just about now, aren't you? Yes, he was. He was scared shitless. No reason at all. But there was also a certain, a certain attraction. Yes, a creation, attraction here. Something about that path, that path leading up the hill and perhaps continuing on into the woods. Surely that path had to go somewhere, didn't it? Yes, of course it did. All paths eventually went somewhere. Lewis, don't forget about Lewis, you dummy. Lewis was the man you came out to see, remember? You came out to see, remember? You didn't come out to Ludlow to go exploring the goddamn woods. What you got there, Randy, the would-be hero cried, his voice still shrilling somehow. Optimistic. Carried well. Replies, excuse me, Randy's reply was almost but not quite obscured, but the growing wail of the fire. Sirens, dead cat. Burnt up? Don't look burnt, Randy. Return just looks dead. Steve's mind returned implacably, as if the exchange across the street had something to do with what he had seen, what he had thought he had seen. That was Lewis. He started to move then, trotting up the path toward the woods, leaving the fire behind him. He had worked up a good sweat by the time he reached the edge of the woods, and the shade felt cool and good. There was the sweet aroma of pine and spruce bark and nut sap. Once into the woods, he broke into an all-out run, not sure why... He was running, not sure why his heart was beating double time. His breath whistled in and out. He was able to lengthen his run to, to a sprint going downhill. The path was admirably clear, but he reached the arch that marked the entrance to the Pet Cemetery as a, at little more than a fast walk. There was a hot stitch high in his right side, just under the armpit. His eyes barely registered the circles of graves. The beaten tin squares, bits of board and slate. His gaze was fixed on the bizarre sight at the far side of the Circular clearing it was fixed on Lewis, who was climbing a deadfall, seemingly in outright defiance of gravity. He mounted the steep fall, fall step by step, his eyes straight ahead like a man who had been mesmerized or who was sleepwalking. In his arms was the white thing that Steve had seen from the tail of his eye. That heh, This close, its configuration was unidentifiable, was undeniable. It was a body, one foot, clad in a black shoe with a low heel protruded, and Steve knew which knew with a sudden, sickening certainty that Lewis was carrying Rachel's body. Lewis's hair had gone white. Lewis, Steve screamed. Lewis didn't hesitate, didn't pause. He reached the top of the dead ball and began down the far side. He'll fall, Steve thought incoherently. He's been damned lucky, incredibly lucky. Pretty soon he's going to fall, and his legs are the only thing he breaks. But Lewis did not fall. He reached the other side of the dead ball, temporarily out of Steve's sight, and then reappeared at, as he walked towards toward the woods again. Lewis, Steve, yelled again. This time, Lewis stopped and turned back. Steve was struck dumb by what he saw. Besides the white hair, Lewis's face was that of an old, old man. At first, there was no recognition at all in Lewis's face. It dawned little by little as if someone was turning a rheostat up in his brain. Lewis's mouth was twitching. After a while, Steve realized that Lewis was trying to smile. Steve, he said in a cracked, uncertain voice, Hello, Steve. I'm going to bury her. I have to do it with my bare hands. Guess a man don't take until dark. The soil up there is very stony. I don't suppose you'd want to give me a hand. Steve opened his mouth, but no words came. In spite of his surprise, in spite of his horror, he did not want to give Lewis a hand. He did want to give Lewis a hand. Somehow up here in the woods it seemed very right, very, very natural. <clears throat> Lewis, he managed to croak at last. What happened? Good Christ, what happened? Was she, was she in the fire? I waited too long with Gage, Lewis said. Something got into him because it, I waited too long. But it will be different with Rachel, Steve. I know it will. He staggered a little, and Steve saw that Lewis had gone insane. He saw this quite clearly. Lewis was insane and abysmally wary. But somehow only the latter seemed to carry weight in his own bewildered mind. I could use some help, Lewis. Said. Lewis, even if I wanted to help you, I couldn't climb over that pile of wood. Oh, yes, Lewis said you could. Just move steadily and don't look down. That's the secret, Steve. He turned then, and although Steve called his name, Lewis moved off into the woods. 
For a few moments, Steve could see the white of the sheet flickering through the trees, then it was gone. He ran across to the dead ball and began to climb it with no thought at all, first feeling with his hands for good hold, attempting to crawl up it, and then gaining his feet. As he did so, a crazy daredevil exhilaration swept over him. It was like hitting it in pure oxygen. He believed he could do it, and he did. Moving swiftly and surely, he reached the top. He stood there for a moment, swaying, watching Lewis move along the path, path which continued on the far side of the dead ball. Lewis turned and looked back at Steve. He held his wife wrapped in a bloody sheet in his arms. You may hear sounds, Lewis said. Sounds like voices. But they are just the loons down south toward Prospect. The sound carries its funny. Lewis. But Lewis had turned away. For a moment, Steve almost followed him. It was very, very close. I could help him. That's what he wants, and I want to help him. Yes, that's the truth. Because there's more going on here than meets the eye, and I want to know what it is. To see, it's very, well, very important. It seems like a secret. Like a mystery, then a branch snapped under one of his candid feet. It made a dry, dusty sound like a st track starter's gun. It brought him back to exactly where he was and what he was doing. Terror leapt into him, and he turned around in a clumsy circle, arms held out for balance, his tongue throat oily with fright, his face bearing the dismayed grimace of a man who wakes up only to find he has sleepwalked his way onto a high skyscraper ledge. She's dead, and I think that maybe Lewis had killed her. Lewis had gone mad, utterly mad, but but there was something worse than madness here. Something much, much worse. It was as if there was a magnet somewhere out in those woods, and he could feel it pulling at something in his brain, pulling him toward that place where Lewis was taking Rachel. Come on, walk the path. Walk the path and see where it goes. We got stuff to show you out here, Steve Arino. Stuff they never told you about in the Atheist Society back in Lake Forest. And then, perhaps simply because it had enough for one day to feed on, lost interest in him, called that place in his mind simply see. Steve took pl two plunging drunken steps back down the side of the downfall. Then more pl branches let go with a grinding rattle and his left foot plunged into the tangled dead wood. Harsh, sharp. Splinters pulled off a sneaker and then tore into his flesh as he yanked free. He fell forward into the pet cemetery, barely missing a piece of orange crate that could easily have punched into his stomach. He got to his feet, staring around, bewildered, and wondered what had happened to him or if anything had happened to him. Already it had begun to seem like a dream. Then from the deep woods behind the dead ball, wood so deep that the light looked green and tarnished, even on the brightest days, a low chuckling or laugh arose. The sound was lot was huge. Steve could not even begin to imagine what sort of creature could have made such a sound. He ran one shoe off and one shoe on, trying to shriek but unable. He was still running when he reached Lewis's house and still trying to shriek when he finally got his bike started and slewed out onto Route 15. He was nearly sideswiped in arriving in a he ne very nearly sideswiped an arriving fire engine from Brewer. Inside his bell helmet, his hair was standing on end. By the time he got back to his apartment in Orono, he could not precisely remember having gone to Ludlow at all. He called in, in sick at the infirmary, took a pill, and went to bed. Steve Masterton never really remembered that day, except in deep dreams, those that come in the small hours of the morning. And in these dreams, he would sense that something huge had, sh had shrugged by him, something which had reached out to touch him and then withdrawn its inhuman hand at the very last second. Something with great yellow eyes which gleamed like fog lamps. Steve sometimes woke shrieking from those, these dreams. His eyes wide and bulging and he would think, you think you were screaming, but it's only the sound of the loons down south in Prospect. The sound carries, it's funny, but he did not know, could not remember what such a thought might mean. The following year he took a job halfway across the country in St. Louis. In the time between his last sight of Lewis Creed and his departure for the Midwest, Steve never went into the town of Ludlow again. That's the end of the book, and we're on to the epilogue, which is short. The police came late that afternoon. They asked questions, but voiced no suspicions. The ashes were still hot. They had not yet been raked. Lewis answered their questions. They seemed satisfied. They spoke outside, and he wore a hat. That was good. If they had seen his gray hair, they might have asked more questions. They would have been bad. That would have been bad. He wore his gardening gloves, and that was good, too. His hands were bloody and ruined. 
He played solitaire that night until long after midnight. He was just dealing a fresh hand when he heard the back door open. What you buy is what you own, and sooner or later what you own will come back to you, Lewis Creed thought. He did not turn around, but only looked at his cards as the slow, grinning footsteps approached. He saw the Queen of Spades. He put his hand up on it. The steps ended directly behind him. Silence. A cold hand fell on Lewis's shoulder. Rachel's voice was grating full of dirt. Darling, it said, and that's the end of the book. And if you enjoyed the book, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, and hit the notification bell. And check me out in my next video on uh, Homer's Odyssey. And you have a great day. Thank you. For, come again.